join me on page 462 in your Methodist hymnal. For tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, verses 1, 2, and 4, please. Rise in body or spirit and join me. And I invite you to turn to the book of Acts. Book of Acts, verse chapter 18. Acts 18 and 19. We're going to look at two sections of scripture uh, in this. Acts 18 and 19. Sometimes there are concerns or confusion about coming into Christ, coming into the body of Christ. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, the salvation experience. Receiving Christ as your Savior and Lord. How does that work? And why is there confusion? Well, I want to look at that just a little bit today uh, from uh, a unique experience, a couple of them, uh, each one of them different, here in 18 and 19. So let's look at uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 28. Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in scripture and uh, came and he came to Ephesus this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord though he knew only the baptism of John so being so he began to speak boldly in the synagogues where Aquila and Priscilla heard him they took him aside and explained the way of God more accurately and when he desired to cross into Achaia the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him and when he arrived he greatly helped those who had believed through grace he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly showing from the scriptures proving also from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ Praise God, what a powerful statement of a man who was confused about the, his relationship with Christ because he was only baptized in John's baptism. And that meant that he did not know salvation. It meant that he had come to John and John said, we want you to believe in Jesus who was to come. 
And he was baptized in the name of John, or in John's baptism. And so they explained to him, Priscilla and Aquila explained the way more, more accurately that, that Jesus is Messiah, yes, but we need to receive him as Savior. We need to ask him to come into our life. We need to uh, experience the new birth, as he told Nicodemus, and, and also to be filled with the Holy Spirit because Pentecost had happened since these, young, these gentlemen, the 12 that were there, I mean, had, since uh, Apollos uh, was, had come through the area, and he had learned the way more accurately, and when he learned the way more accurately, he, he, he fiercely and powerfully uh, proclaimed the gospel of eternal salvation in the person of Christ and proved to the folks that Jesus was who he said he was and is Messiah, King of kings and Lord of lords. So that's one episode, and it demonstrates sometimes that we might have an issue with understanding the nature of salvation and, and what God wants us to see in the New Testament. I've run into folks like that in the Methodist Church, and probably they're scattered out all over Christianity, the Christian world. One other episode that's very similar to that goes in a different direction. It's in the next, next chapter. You just keep reading over into chapter 19. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper coast or the upper regions of, of Ephesus and finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to, said to him, We've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. In effect, they, in effect, they said, A Holy Spirit? What's a Holy Spirit? That's the title of the message, as a matter of fact. What's a Holy Spirit? And he said to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, to, into John's baptism. So once again, we have some men who didn't understand the greater story of the king of glory and what Jesus, who Jesus was and how he related to each one of them in salvation. Paul then said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, Jesus Christ. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now the men were about 12 in all. And that doesn't mean they were 12 years old. It means there were 12 of them. Didn't need to clear that up. Important issue in each one of our lives that we are absolutely clear as to where we stand with God. So I want to talk about that just a little bit from all my perspective. The Holy Spirit is mentioned around 100 times in the New Testament. And he's mentioned a lot of times in the Old Testament as well. These two scriptures uh, of people that only had a taste of John's baptism but not Jesus' baptism or baptism in Jesus' name didn't yet understand the nature of salvation and the power of the Holy Spirit which is available to them. The Holy Spirit is one of the three names of God. There are the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Quite often we sweep the day of Pentecost under the carpet because the ministry and purpose of the Holy Spirit is not for us as significant as Christmas and, and Easter. And one of the reasons that is because the Holy Spirit intentionally does not glorify himself. If you read in Scripture, he says he came to glorify Jesus. That was his purpose. That's his goal, and to help us along the way as a comforter. But you don't see anywhere in Scripture the Holy Spirit ex glorifying himself, but glorifying Jesus primarily and helping us to learn more about him. So uh, all three of the Trinity is mentioned in a number of Scriptures in the New Testament. Here's a couple, for instance. In John 14, six, verses 16 and 17, and I, Jesus, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because he neither sees him, and they neither see him or know him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. So that's all three of the Trinity in that one verse, or those two verses. In John 14, 26, the helper, the Holy Spirit, who the Father will send you in my name, Jesus said, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. So there's 
uh, all, the Trinity once again. Here's another episode or ex example of that. John 15, 26. But when the Helper comes, I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And so that's, if, if you notice that, I want to read it one more time, but it has the Trinity in two places in that one verse. This is an interesting verse. It says, once again, but when the Helper comes who I will send you from the Father, that's one trinity, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. So that's another time that the trinity is mentioned in that one verse. John 16, 12 through 15, there's no, there's no much, not much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it. There is much more that I want to tell you, Jesus said, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will, not, he will not speak on his own, but he'll tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will, bring, he will bring me glory and tell you whatever he hears from me. All that the Father has belongs to me. This is why I say that the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. The Holy Spirit is our helper. He wants to come and be intimately involved not superficially involved, but intimately involved in your life as you walk with God, as you exalt Jesus in your life, and as you learn and walk with him as we all do. When I was, uh, one of the years that annual conference was meeting, by the way, we had a very good conference at Brentwood this time. I was, uh, I was on Zoom the whole time, and uh, so was so was uh, Burl. She had to take over for Charles, who was having some family issues in Florida. So Burl was our alternate this year, and she did. She she was on online with the conference. It was the inaugural conference, the first conference uh, that we've had as a Tennessee Western Kentucky annual conference. So it was an important one. It was. They're all important. But but at Martin Methodist College, one year the the annual conference met. Uh, the Tennessee Conference met at, at an annual conference there at Martin College, and, and I was in one of the meetings. A preacher was preaching along, doing a good job, and he had an illustration. He said, he said one day he came home, or he, he went to be uh, visit his sister, his newlywed sister, in their in their home. First time he'd been there since they had uh, got married. She and his sister, I mean his sister and her uh, husband, had gotten married. And so he went into the house, and he told his sister, I'm, I want to wash my hands before we eat supper. She said, okay, back on the left. So he went in, washed his hands, and when she heard the water turn off, he heard her shout from the kitchen, don't touch those towels. Those are show towels. <laughs> Do you know what a show towel is? Y'all got some show towels in your hand. You don't use show towels. You don't dry your hands with show towels. They're there for a different purpose. They're there just to look pretty. You don't dr And I've gotten a lot of Linda's show towels. She doesn't have show towels. I'm just <laughs> messing with Linda. But uh, I've gotten a lot of towels which, thank goodness, weren't show towels. Real dirty because I didn't do a good job washing my hands. But, but um, at any rate, uh, show towels have a purpose, but their purpose is not what we ordinarily think of show towels I mean, of regular towels as being. They're just there to look pretty. The comforter, the Holy Spirit, is all about being involved in our lives. He is not a show spirit. He is not a show towel. He wants to be involved in every aspect of your life as a believer. Every aspect. Never exalting himself, always glorifying Jesus. Jesus said in John 16, 7, it's to your advantage. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, the, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you, the Holy Spirit. Many Christians don't really understand or maybe they don't believe that verse at all. They want to believe that, no, it's not about the Holy Spirit coming. I want Jesus to stay here on the earth like he was back then, I want him to be on the earth here now so I can see him, so I can get my, so I can hug him, so I can talk to him, and so I can understand better about the kingdom of God. But Jesus on the earth could only be with a few people at a time. Well, he could be with the thousands, the multitudes, but I don't, I, 
it's a miracle that they could all hear him, but they could. He had a, the Holy Spirit did something amazing there. But he was limited to an earthly existence. And I don't know about growing old if he had just stayed here. He wasn't under the, the curse of uh, sin, no, no fall of nature. Brother Kelly, maybe we can talk about that sometime. Did, did Jesus keep getting older? I don't know. I doubt it. Well, I don't know. And so, anyway, that's irrelevant to what I was talking about. Jesus here on the earth could not meet the needs of planet earth. He had, the Bible says, he could do, he could do no mighty miracles in, in Nazareth because of their unbelief. He, he, he was affected by uh, being tired. He went to sleep in the bow of the boat and, and was hungry and was thirsty and, and things like that and expressed uh, fear and things like that at the time of his crucifixion. Uh, but you and I understand that now since the day of Pentecost, and I looked this up this morning, that in 2022, the world population is 7,937,081,566. And probably 67 has been born by the time we started church. But anyway, uh, the Holy Spirit, if the people would let him, would come and indwell all 7,937,081,566 people. He would come and inhabit every individual on planet Earth. He can do it. That's what he's designed us for, to be indwelling in us. And he, he craves to be involved intimately like that with his people. But we've got to let him do that. There is great resistance in the world about walking with God. Folks don't want God controlling their life. That's how they feel. And, and there's a good reason why that's there, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. Now, as believers, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, the Comforter has come to you, but, when he, shall, when, but he, shall be, he has come to you, but he will be in you soon. As the death, at the death of Jesus Christ, the, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, indicating that God did that from top to bottom. God no longer resides in a building, the temple. Now, through the Holy Spirit, God's moved in to the temple into, in our bodies, and we have become the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is that God has moved into the mobile home business. He, we are the mobile homes that God has moved into. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, 8, when the Comforter comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He said he will convict the world of sin because they don't believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you will see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And many people read that verse and they say, well, God's, God, you know, you, you, what I hear you saying in these verses, God, is that I'm wrong, I'm not living right, and God's out to get me. And people interpret those scriptures like that. But what Jesus wants us to see in these verses is that we need a Savior. And that salvation is a love thing which God wants to pour out in our lives with truth and grace and mercy and, and holiness. And he's saying that when I know the righteousness and person of the Lord Jesus Christ I am made righteous with God and you know the verse that says if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us for all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and that Christ in his power he has overcome the power of the enemy and given us victory and power over Satan he loves us God loves us and has worked and given us everything we need under his creation. As creator, he knows what we need. And as creator, he gives us, in his power, in his grace, everything that we need. For my God has given you everything that you need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Thank God. The Holy Spirit is our friend. He loves you and he loves me. He's not a ghost, he's not a boogeyman. He's a very real person. He won't make you go crazy and do strange things. He loves you. You can trust him, and you can love him back. 
You know his character. It's the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what the Holy Spirit is like. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants to produce in us individually. You and I, as believers who are growing in the Lord, ought to be able to see all of the fruit of the Spirit growing and, and, and making a difference in our lives. I've heard people say, well, my, the fruit of the Spirit that I got was the Spirit of, uh, of uh, joy. That's my fruit. No, we are supposed to. Uh, now, now, gifts, maybe you can say that. I've got the gift of, uh, of wisdom. Or I've got the gift of prophecy. But as far as the fruit of the Spirit goes, we're supposed to have all nine of them. And if you are seeing areas in your life that don't line up with one of the fruits of the Spirit, it means that you need to let the Holy Spirit do some tweaking in your life. He wants to adjust some stuff. And the fruit of the Spirit is like a litmus test that takes us to that point so that we can understand our walk with God and, and how we're doing in our walk with God and what He wants from us. The fruit of the Spirit. We can't do that without the power, grace, and anointing of the Holy Spirit. We can't know that unless we're filled with the Holy Spirit. There are people who make other people afraid of the Holy Spirit. But there is absolutely nothing to fear or be afraid of in the Holy Spirit. He loves you just as the Father and Jesus love you. Did you know John 17, the high priestly prayer of the Lord Jesus Christ? He said, Lord, I pray that you would let them know that you love them just as much as you love me. I love that verse. To know the Father loves me just as much as he loves Jesus. Whew, that's heavy. And that's a good thing. What do you think? Just gave, give it a, a second here. What do you think Satan wants you to believe about the Holy Spirit? Satan wants you to believe that the Holy Spirit is out to deceive you, just like he is. He wants you to believe that the Holy Spirit is dangerous, fearful, and you don't have any, shouldn't have anything to do with the Holy Spirit. He wants you to believe the Holy Spirit's a boogeyman. Stay away from the Holy Spirit. I ask a pastor, a Methodist pastor, a retiring Methodist pastor, not this one or that one, but it was a long time ago. I said, I said, uh, brother, what do you, do you know the Holy Spirit? Oh, no, sir, don't tell me about all that crazy chandelier swinging and pew hopping and rolling in the sawdust stuff, that, all that emotional stuff, all that crazy stuff, not for me. And so he's, he had rejected the beauty of the sweet, sweet Holy Spirit that we sing about because Satan had convinced him that that's what it was about. Or maybe he was seeing other people who told him that or were acting like that. If you want to know what the Holy Spirit's like, just look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That's what he's like. He describes himself to us so that we may understand. Multitudes of people who fall in love with Jesus Christ were wonderfully transformed and began expressing the spiritual fruit, the gifts of the Spirit, the power and sound mindness of the Spirit. Scripture says in 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I want to take you real quickly as we close uh, to a scripture that you may have never associated with the power and ministry and purpose of the Holy Spirit. It's way over there in Matthew chapter 5. Some of you know what chapter 5 is and what starts in chapter 5, and it's the Beatitudes. As I was looking through the Beatitudes this morning, or I was, I was studying and reviewing for this message, I said, it was like the Holy Spirit said, the Beatitudes are an example of the living experience of the Holy Spirit. And here's what Jesus said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Poor in spirit means that we don't recognize ourselves as glorious. It's, it's, a, it's like humility. It's like I'm not exalting myself here. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Mourning has to do with godly sorrow for our sins. That's a spiritual thing. That's a work of the Holy Spirit that brings you to the place that you even care that you have sinned. 
and, and these, are, these are Holy Spirit blessings that God wants to bring us into. He said, he said uh, blessed are the meek, for theirs shall, they shall inherit the earth. That's, that's the power of the Holy Spirit being in our lives. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. God's work, the Holy Spirit's work. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for there she shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You're not going to get persecuted for righteousness' sake if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You're not going to let it happen. I'm more important than the Holy Spirit if I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm Lord of my life. But filled with the Holy Spirit produces in us a sacrifice to the Lord that he is Lord of our lives now, not us. Blessed, that's what happened in me. I watched myself get off the throne. And I get back on there sometimes. And he, 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 can, go like, he can go like that and get me off that throne. He just bumped me off the throne. It ain't easy either. I mean, my bed at home, I've got to get a running start to get up in my bed at home. <laughs> and so high up. And God's throne is even higher than that. And you bump you. And, and I had my, th my throne. I had my throne higher than that. When I sit on my throne, God knocks me off. It's about a four foot drop. So it's not easy getting knocked off your throne. You know what I mean by that, I'm sure. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And there, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Great rejoice and be exceedingly glad for the greatest your reward in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets. You are the salt of the earth in the Holy Spirit. You are the light of the world in the Holy Spirit. He doesn't say in the Holy Spirit, but it's it, it got to be understood here. The Holy Spirit is our life and brings life brings Jesus to life in us. And here's the kicker. Let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and glorify your heavenly Father, the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Let your light shine. Not that you're out trying to make everybody impressed, but the Holy Spirit wants to shine your light because he's working in you so that others might come to be saved. It's not that you're going to go out witnessing for Christ. We witness more for the way we live than we do by the words we say. But the words we say are important, and you have occasional opportunities to, to share Jesus with somebody and perhaps even to lead them to the throne of grace to find salvation. Hopefully, hopefully that happens. But we walk in the world but not of the world. Isn't that right? And God wants us to glorify him as we go. We can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to have a final song, and, and if I didn't get the number right, uh, Melanie will correct it. It's right. Uh, hallelujah. <laughs> hallelujah. And the altar is open for you if you'd like to come spend some time here in prayer. Listen closely to the Spirit of God, and let's worship Him in this final hymn, Through It All. How many all right. times are you going to sing it? We're going to do it twice. Twice? Okay. Yes. This is a good little Andre Crouch little phrase. If you'll rise in body or spirit and join me on page 507 for Through It All.
Are there any testimonies today? Anybody want to share a word for the Lord?